He grew up in tiny Oil City, Pennsylvania, the son of immigrant parents. He showed no interest in flying until 1938 and his college days at Notre Dame. And nearly no one described him as a natural pilot. But he was a natural warrior. He was one of a handful of fighter pilots who launched themselves against the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. His first air combat was fought in a British Spitfire with a Polish fighter squadron. But he would make his mark with the P-47 Thunderbolt, emerging from World War II as the top ace in the European theater with 31 German kills. He would go to war again in Korea and achieve his ace's status a second time, this time in jet fighters. His experience led him to create a completely new set of air combat tactics that saved American lives. His name, Francis S. Gabby Gabreski, and he is a legend of air power. Francis Gabrzewski, third of five children of his Polish immigrant parents. They lived in a small town north of Pittsburgh called Oil City and ran the local grocery store. They changed the name to Gabreski to make it easier to pronounce. But the boy who would become one of America's greatest air aces spoke his entire life with a pronounced Polish accent. Francis Gabreski graduated high school in 1938 just as Hitler's legions marched into Austria. He says his eyes were focused on college, on Notre Dame, and eventually medical school, like his older brother. After Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939, Gabreski knew the United States would be going to war. And when it did, he was determined his weapon would be an airplane. He joined the Army Air Corps as a cadet in 1940. He trained in PT-17 Stearman biplanes with sleek blue and yellow paint. Gabreski admits he was not a natural pilot. He was nervous, always trying to wrestle the airplane around in the sky, compensating for the torque of the radial engines. He nearly didn't make the grade, but he did qualify. And after some advanced training, was allowed to select his first assignment. He chose some place that sounded glamorous, exciting. I chose uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, I mean, it was a glamorous place. I read about it from travel lodge and so forth. It's a uh, uh, beautiful climate. The people are nice and tan, beautiful and so forth. And the girls are even prettier. But so, Gabreski uh, found himself I, in at the start of the war he knew was coming. I was getting ready for church and I could hear the bombardment off in the distance. And I paid no attention to it because the Navy does have a range in the mountains. And they, uh, they work seven days out of the eight. There's Sunday, Sundays where they, they probably drop a few of the uh, track practice bombs. And then all of a sudden I heard machine gun fire. And that machine gun fire was right next over me. And I looked out the window, and sure enough, there was a zero flying with his machine guns wide open and so forth, strafing everything before him. And I saw the rising sun. And that was my first indoctrination into World War II. And of course, there's no question about being scared. I was scared stiff, but at the same time, I was trained to do a job. We looked at the line, and of course, the buildings, that, that some of the hangar lines were going up in flames. The flight line was going up in flames. Our number one job was to move away the intact airplanes away from the burning airplanes. And of course that wasn't easy because all our ammunition was in the hangar line, the hangar line was up in flames, and it was just like Roman candles then. In other words, you could see the uh, the tracers coming up and firing, and uh, they were more scary than they were destructive. So we did our work, airmen as well as officers, 
shoved out the airplanes, away from the uh, burning airplanes. And uh, by, the, uh, by the end of, uh, say, an hour, an hour and a half, well, we were able to save about uh, 75 of the 150 airplanes that were parked on, on the line. We did uh, become airborne about uh, two hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was a very, uh, I would say, uh, somber flight. I uh, looked down from about 6,000 feet over Pearl Harbor and saw all those airplanes just over off from their side or going up in, in flames. And it was just a big billowing black smoke all over Pearl Harbor. Much of the air power of the Pacific gone, and the Navy clearly in charge, Gabreski felt out of the action. The Air Corps found itself trying to salvage what was left of its Pacific bases. himself to a Polish squadron to learn their combat tactics. He would then pass them along to the Americans when they arrived in Europe. His idea earned him a trip to Washington and a promotion to captain on his way to London. I came over as a casual, I came over as an individual flying with the Polish Air Force to gain experience. So I joined the 315 squadron that was flying Spit 9s, and it was a, just a super airplane. So I flew with them on 20 missions. In February 1943, Gabreski left the Polish squadron. The Americans were arriving in England in force, and it was time to put the lessons learned to the test. He joined the 56th Fighter Squadron of the U.S. 8th Air Force and met his new aircraft, the P-47 Thunderbolt. After the tight quarters and sleek lines of the Spitfire, the Thunderbolt was a battleship. After 20 missions with the, uh, with the uh, Polish Air Force, I joined the 56, which was the first airplane, first group that was coming in intact from the United States of America with a brand new airplane, a P-47. So you can imagine when I went from a Spitfire, which is nothing more than about a 7,500-pound 7, 7, airplane, to this great big belly uh, a tub that I saw, I said, my God, what a big airplane. It was twice the size of a Spitfire. But uh, uh, I, it, uh, it, it turned me off immediately, but I, that was the only thing I had to fight with, fight in, and that I was going to learn to fly it. So I took the airplane up, and it was a good airplane. It was a good airplane because it had a turbine supercharger that could derive a 2,000 horsepower uh, at sea level as well as up to 30,000 feet when the velocity of the, of the uh, turbine supercharger would not accelerate any faster because it would de deteriorate, I mean, disintegrate. Unlike the mission of the Spitfire to intercept and shoot down attacking German bombers and fighters, the role of the Thunderbolt was clear. Protect the bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force. Also, unlike the Luftwaffe and the RAF, he was about to command a unit in a uniquely American Air Corps. We were all amateurs. The Germans were all pros. The RAF, they were pros. And all the Belgium, all the other Allied forces, they were pros by the time that we were there. So we were going to learn from them. And it took us uh, quite a few missions before we felt very comfortable in the operating field where we knew what we were doing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
The U.S. 8th Air Force was in Europe to carry out daytime strategic bombing of the enemy. The B-17s were slow, long-range bombers, and the 56th Fighter Group was to escort those bombers to or from the target to protect them from German fighters the best way they could and come home. After a non-combat injury sidelined him for several months, Gabreski came back with a vengeance. On August 24th, 1943, he scored his first confirmed victory, an FW-190. On September 2nd, he scored his second. You're not out there to uh, glamorize uh, the destruction of fighter aircraft. You're there on a specific mission to keep those bombers from being shot down. In other words, if you could scare away, which we have on many occasions, where the uh, Falkhoff 190s and uh, 109s would break off because we'd start coming in head on to them and with our guns wide open and so forth, firing at them, so they'd turn over and go down to the deck. We wouldn't follow them, naturally. I mean, uh, because we did our job. In January 1944, General Jimmy Doolittle, fresh to the 8th Air Force from his North African experience commanding the 15th, changed the general orders for U.S. Fighter Command. The only way to beat the Germans was to eliminate their aircraft and pilots. The role of the fighters was no longer to simply escort bombers. Now they had clearance to pursue and flame every German aircraft they could, in the air or on the ground. missions over Germany using extender tanks, the P-47s of the 56 scored 59 kills in five missions. Gabreski owned three of them, running his number to 11. He was now an ace twice over, and now he was racking up kills faster than his crew could keep him in swastika decals. In May, he scored three more kills in a single day, with a fourth listed as probable. By D-Day, June 6, 1944, Gabreski was in contention for the highest ranking ace in the 8th Air Force. Truth be told, he was anxious to match the numbers set by a pilot from his group who had been sent home after 27 air victories. A month later, Gabreski did the impossible. He beat the record with a 28th air victory. He could now go home. Gabreski had been overseas nearly two years and flown 165 missions. His fiancée was waiting with plans to get married as soon as he got home. Gabby was ecstatic. With the exception of an injury to a pinky finger, he had come through without a scratch. Gabreski collected his orders, packed and scheduled to begin the long journey home July 20th, 1944. He stopped by the operations hut on his way out to say goodbye. They were busy preparing to fly another escort mission over Germany. It looked like the kind of mission where a hot pilot could run up another couple of kills. He had 31. Could he score more? Gabreski decided he had one more mission to fly. They found an airfield west of Koblenz and decided to let each of the flights take a crack at it. Gabreski led his flight team down and during his pass exploded a German bomber. He 
turned to make another pass, hugging the ground too close. The propellers hit, and Francis Gabreski, America's hottest air ace, was down in Germany. He would spend the rest of the war in a German POW camp. His Stalag Luft was freed on May 13, 1945. A year later, Lieutenant Colonel Gabby Gabreski, 26 years old, and credited with 31 kills, retired from the Army Air Corps. But that's not the end of the story. Like many returning vets, Gabreski was anxious to complete his college degree and take up his married life. He and his wife thought the civilian life looked good, and he managed to snag a job with Douglas Aircraft. It lasted less than a year. Gabreski missed the cockpit and flying. He applied for a permanent commission, and in April 1947, returned to the Army Air Force as a lieutenant colonel. Less than a year later, he was assigned to command the 56th Fighter Group, his old combat unit, and with it came promotion to full colonel. It was peacetime work, but not for long. Tension in Korea finally exploded into open warfare, and Gabby found himself watching from the sidelines. The war went back and forth, and it looked like it would be over once MacArthur landed at Incheon. But in mid-1950, a new weapon launched into the skies, and the Americans found themselves fighting a hot new fighter, the MiG-15. Gabreski's command had just made the transition to F-86 Sabre fighters, and he wondered more than once how the planes would stack up. He was going to find out. In May 1951, Colonel Gabreski reported to K-14, the air base near Kimpo, South Korea. Gabreski was assigned to the 4th Fighter Group as Deputy Wing Commander. They had only 50 F-86s, and their mission was to distract the MiGs away from the slower Mustangs and F-80s. To do that, they flew the area the pilots called MiG Alley. When MiG-15 came into the theater, uh, that put another sort of dimension. That's when I went out to, to operate in the, Europe, in the uh, Korean theater, uh, because the MiG-15 was so superior to any other airplane that we ever had there. So the only offset to that was F-86. F-86, which, which was a, <coughs> it, it was a Mach .9192 airplane, equivalent to the MiG-15. So that put us on par, and it kept again the uh, the MiG-15 from destroying the uh, F-80s and the F-84. And if you get a bounce, cut him off, and drive him in range. When you get in range, shoot. And when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go again. On April 1st, 1952, Gabreski led his group back into MiG Alley.
He had four kills and wanted his fifth. He went head to head with a MiG-15 and after three passes, he watched the pilot pop his canopy and bail out. He was over his 100 mission limit, though he and another veteran had given orders that their sorties not be posted anymore. But he had had enough. With six and a half kills credited to him and his 31 from World War II, he is the third top air ace in American history. On June 4th, the Air Force sent him home. He had a stop along the way. President Harry Truman called him to the White House and thanked him personally. I've had everything from a squadron to a group to a wing and I've been in the cockpit up until I retire. Colonel Francis Gabreski ended his combat role that summer of 1952, but his career continued. He remained in the Air Force until 1967, commanding units at bases from Kadena to Hickam to Adana, Turkey. He had flown aircraft from the old P-40 to the heavy P-47, where he achieved glory. He made the transition to jet fighters of the F-86 and had flown everything up to the F-111 supersonic fighter bomber. His record of 37 and a half kills stands today. He set standards for performance and tactics for all his contributions to the U.S. Air Force. Colonel Francis S. Gabby Gabreski is a legend of air power.